all we have been doing concerning John is address the garden. And I repeat that continually because that's what I want to emphasize. Weeks ago, maybe even months ago now, before getting into John and what John means and represents to the narrative of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, prior to all of this, the idea or the notion of addressing the garden kicked in because months before that, it had been about the agent in the garden, the illustration in the garden, the scene in the garden, the conception and the error in the garden, how to prevent that, what could have been done different, what is the gospel of the garden? Before the gospel of the Christian theory came about, Bible had a gospel within it. And before Bible's gospel came about, the original writers of the Bible had a quote-unquote gospel of their own, which gospel can be found in the first three chapters of the book of Genesis. Looking at all of that, seeing the failure therein of that garden, and then wanting to address a particular portion of the garden of the belief concerning the body of our belief, which led to John. And when going through the character of what John is, which is very fascinating, which is very interesting, a lot gets brought out. But before going over the a lot that gets brought out, there is something very notable concerning the things that we are reviewing when it comes to John that the writer Josephus points out and in quite an amazing way, I, I, will, I should say. There must therefore naturally arise great difference among writers when they had no original record to lay for their foundation. Now notice that there naturally arises a great difference among writers when there is no original record for their foundation, which might at once inform those who had an inclination to learn and contradict those that would tell lies. However, we are to suppose a second occasion besides the former of these contradictions. It is this, that those who were the most zealous to write history were not solicitous for the discovery of truth. Let me just read that again. Those who were the most zealous to write history were not solicitous for the discovery of truth, although it was very easy for them always to make such a profession. But their business was to demonstrate that they could write well and make an impression upon mankind thereby and in what manner of writing they thought they were able to exceed others, to that did they apply themselves. Some of them betook themselves to the writings of fabulous narrations. Some of them endeavored to please the cities or the kings, which is what he actually did, by writing in their commendation. Others of them fell to finding fault with transactions or with the writers of such transactions and thought to make a great figure by so doing. And indeed, these do what is of all things the most contrary to true history. For it is the great character of true history that all concerned therein both speak and write the same things. I'm going to read that again. For it is the great character of true history that all concerned therein both speak and write the same things, while these men, by writing differently about the same things. Does that sound familiar about any of the four Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John's and Acts that we are and have been discussing? Both speak and write the same things, while these men, by writing differently about the same things, think they shall be believed to write with the greatest regard to truth. We, therefore, who are Jews, must yield to the Grecian writers as to language and eloquence of composition. But then we shall give them no such preference as to the verity of ancient history, and least of all, as to that part which concerns 
the affairs of our own several countries. Now I have this here because this is exactly, this is exactly when you get to the Matthew, to the Mark, to the Luke, to the John, this is exactly what we find, right? We find writers writing different things and it is supposed to be believed to be true. But here we have someone from that time period letting us know the mind state of that time period concerning the writers, concerning the authors, and especially those that would purport history. It's not for fact. It is to please and to gain a hold upon mankind. When we have been digging into the John character, this is exactly what we are finding that John character to be. Everything here described everything here described by this author. I think Josephus might have told on himself there, but that's what makes it so interesting. What makes it so interesting is that these writers, we're not talking about 1930s writers, 2024 writers. We're not talking about Western culture writers. We're talking about writers from those Roman Empire times. We're talking about writers of antiquity. They are writing to place before the reader's eyes fiction to be taken as truth. That's the literary scheme. That's the literary structure. Is it deception? To them back then, maybe not so much. To us now, we may look at it as that. For those of us that want a reasonable devotional experience, for those of us that want to recover from whatever trauma, religion, spirituality, irreligion, or philosophical spirituality has caused to us, this is the art of deception. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and the Acts, and everything thereafter, until you get to the Revelation. It is the art, the art of deception. That's the literary scheme, that's the literary structure, and that's what it is. It's art. If we're going to look at it the way that it ought to be, in a clear mind, to gain value from what these things are, it's art. And Josephus is letting us know the art, the art of which he himself wrote with, and the art that belongs to the authors composing Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and the Acts. Because when we are going through and addressing the garden, following the instructions, that's all we're doing. Following the instructions. That's all we're doing. That's all that should have been done. And if it had been done, if it had been done, things would be a little bit different. As we can see, going through the garden, zoning in on a particular patch of that garden, character of that garden john we come across certain things we come across john's john the baptist identity the the construct of his character we come across the mission of that character the trap of the west wind we come across the doctrine of repentance its use its need its methodology we come across the elijah john comparison why is it relevant What's the method there for both? How do they sync? And what is the time period? Because the age is relevant. The comparison is relevant because the age of Elijah is relevant. The language and context used. Luke and Mark's linguistic narrative structure. Going through the garden. The garden of this belief of the Christian theory. This particular patch of that garden, linguistic culture, linguistic context, and the philosophy of that linguistic context and culture, it matters. It matters. The importance of 70 AD to this narrative. Why is it so important? How is it so important? And in what ways is it in the narrative? It's not blatant. It's all figurative. It's all referenced. It's all by citation. The Western esoteric Jewish religion that formed due to the evidence of 70 AD, 
otherwise known as Gnosticism. All of this has been in what we have been looking into this garden of the body of the belief of the Christian theory. The son of man construct. The son of man construct. And a lot more because the language and the context gives us a lot more and we have seen a lot more than this list. So when it when it comes to justification, right? Because that's what all of this is about. What are you and not you specifically? Your devotional conversation is what is that to be justified from? Because this this justification isn't something that I have created. I'm taking this concept from the philosophy that is within the scriptures for which this word exists. I'm pulling this. This isn't me. Bible lets its sincere audience and the sincere patient of its words know that its devotional conversation needs to be justified. The immediate question is justified from what? Justified from what? Well, we're seeing what the devotional conversation needs to be justified from. Needs to be justified from action, from thought, from feeling, and from behavior that is connected to the theoretical garden of its belief. And when addressing that garden, we're able to address justification. Understand the deeper meaning behind the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. Discover an allegory that speaks to personal and intellectual devotional growth. Meet the Dawn of Devotion, a sacrifice for devotional evolution. This book challenges traditional interpretations of Jesus' resurrection and crucifixion. Explore the allegorical journey reflecting personal and intellectual growth. Experience a narrative that transforms your understanding of devotion. Get your copy of The Dawn of Devotion, a sacrifice for devotional evolution today, and begin your resurrection. What does it mean to dress the garden? What does it mean to address? Because that's what that word dress means. What does it mean to address the garden? Looking at 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel 13, 7 to 9. Then David sent home to Tamar, saying, Go now to thy brother Amnon's house and dress him meat. So Tamar went to her brother Amnon's house. He was laid down. She took flour, kneaded it, made cakes in his side, did bake the cake. She took a pan, poured them out before him, but he refused to eat. When dressing or addressing anything, and we're here specifically dealing with the garden of the body of our belief and the belief of the Christian theory, to dress that or to address that, it means to use our hands and our minds to develop a product that is for diet and that can sustain and that is for sustenance. To use our hands and our minds to develop a product that is for diet, that is for sustenance. That's what it means in looking at this to dress the garden. See the methodology there that is used. See how the hands work and with the hands goes the mind. And then with that dressing, by hand and mind goes service. That's what it means to dress as we are dressing and have been. To the Second Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians 3, 7 to 10. For yourselves know how you ought to follow us, for we behave not ourselves disorderly among you. Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought with labor and travail night and day that we might not be chargeable to any of you. Not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an example unto you to follow us. For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. When it comes to that dressing and addressing, the particular labor for sustenance is needed. That's what it means to dress. The charge. That's why it was so difficult because the illustration there in Genesis 2 and Genesis 3 depict the nature of the human being. 
it's not pleasing or entertaining to the human being to do anything of this nature. Because when you're dressing or addressing something, you're going over it over and over and over again, using hand and mind, and you have to sustain for yourself. The human being does not naturally want to do this. I'm sure we know this. The human being doesn't want to sustain itself, the natural human being. For the human being to want to sustain itself, it is abnormal. That's an abnormal behavior because the human being generally wants what is easy, what is able to be followed. And the human being wants to be told what to follow. To go against the grain of this DNA, <laughs> this natural phenomenon within the human being, it is, it is an abnormal act. That's why it's given. It's given because once that abnormal act is able to do what it's supposed to do, it no longer becomes abnormal. It doesn't become about work because at first that's what it will seem like but if none will work you you have no right to eat and that's why there is a lot of going from pastor to pastor there was a lot of quoting from pastor so and so there was a lot of trust going on to random experts or scholarly experts that have no penetrating understanding of what's going on linguistically philosophically and contextually within the scriptures because none are doing the work to eat. None are dressing and addressing, not simply the garden of the religious theory, the garden of what is within. Continuing, Proverbs 28, 29. Proverbs 28, 29. He that tilleth his land shall have plenty of bread. But he that followeth after vain persons shall have poverty enough. Why? Why is it that one should not eat if they will not work? Because they're not putting in the work to till that land. Now, we call money bread and all of that, right? Well, the Bible has its own thing. Because he that does not till that land will have no bread. To us, bread is money. To the Bible, bread is still money. Only thing is, to the Bible's mind, the money that is to be earned that is called bread in the scripture language, scripture slang, bread, is wisdom, is understanding. And if one is not able to till that land, because the tilling of that land is the dressing or the addressing of that land, one is not able to do so there will be no bread to eat or there will be no understanding. There will be no understanding to sustain. Now, if we were paying attention to the illustration that I gave or the verse that I gave between Tamar and, and Amnon, she was told to go and to dress him meat. But was it actually meat that she gave to him? Going back, 2 Samuel 13, 7-9. Then David sent to Tamar, saying, Go now to thy brother Amnon's house and dress him meat. So Tamar went to her brother Amnon's house. He was laid down. She took animal, right? That's what it says? No. She took flour and kneaded it and made cakes in his sight and did bake the cakes. To the Bible's mind, meat is not literal meat, right? We can get this in various illustrations. But to the Bible's mind, the beginning of meat the, the, the foundation of meat, its structure, it begins with flour. Flour is not anything close to meat or to flesh and blood. To the Bible's mind, though, we just have to remember, this is Bible mind. To the Bible's mind, meat begins with flour. And whatsoever you do with that flour, you're making meat. You're giving meat. You're fixing meat. You're baking meat. You're seasoning meat. Your pan searing meat. This is bread in reality. Bible calls meat bread. The Bible calls meat bread. Why? Hebrews 13 9. 
Be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines, for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats. For we have not profited them, which have not profited them, that have been occupied therein. If we're looking at this verse clearly, meat, meats, equal doctrine, equal doctrines. Be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines, with meats that have not profited them, that have not been occupied therein. To the Bible's mind, while bread equals meat, meat equals doctrine. Going to the book of Romans. Romans 14, 19 and 20. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another. For meat destroy not the work of God. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for that man who eateth with offense. Meat equals what may and is intended to edify. The author writing this chapter is not talking about liter literal dietary custom, literal dietary habits. That's not what this author is talking about. Meat equals what is to, and the, and the author clearly understands the figurative illustration connected to meat from Genesis to Malachi. That's why they're employing it in this context. What can edify? Meat equals what can edify? which is bread, still to the Bible's mind, which is bread. Now, turning to the book of Amos, what bread? Amos 8.11, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. When we till our land, we're supposed to reap the bread of meat. When we till our lands, and the tilling of the land is the dressing of the garden. Whether that land is within us or whether that land is the land of the theory for which our body of belief belongs to. When we till that land, we will get bread. Or we will get meat. Or we will get understanding. Doctrine, philosophy, counsel, wisdom. That's the point. That's the point behind dressing the garden. And that's the point behind the, the method of dressing the garden. Using our hands and our minds to put, to put something into shape. To put something into shape that can be used for diet and for sustenance. That's what it means to dress the garden. That's what it means to address the garden of what is within, the land within and the territory belonging to the body of our belief. Because when we're doing so, we are avoiding, absolutely avoiding, what Josephus is, is, is stating as we began with in his, in his quote. We are avoiding falling into that trap, falling into that deception, and we are able to look at the documents, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, everything thereafter, for the art and for the culture that it is to be able to grasp in a way that is beneficial, that is benevolent, that is positive for the growth and for the development. If we so choose to go that route of looking at these things there and its continued growth and development of the growth and the de development of our devotional conversation. Ever wondered how to truly connect with the Bible? In just 60 seconds, you'll discover a unique way to deepen your faith. Knowing Bible is a course crafted to bring you closer to the Bible and yourself. Tailored to fit your learning goals, it offers a personal journey. Through readings, reflections, and interactive classroom dynamics, you'll grow spiritually. Assignments are designed to give you space for personal devotion. This course helps you envision a devotional experience that truly suits you. Imagine a course that meets you where you are and takes you deeper. Don't miss this chance to transform your spiritual life. Click the link in the description for more information. So what is the counsel, what is the advice that Bible gives for the kind of land that is to be tilled, for the kind of land that is to be dressed or addressed? Looking in the book of Hosea, Hosea 10, 12 and 13, Sow to yourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy. Break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord till he come and rain righteousness upon you. 
You have plowed wickedness. You have reaped iniquity. You have eaten the fruit of lies, but thou didst trust in thy way in the multitude of thy mighty men. Now, this is prime advice. This is prime advice because you can go to the book of Deuteronomy and you can see that what is supposed to be rained down, it says righteousness in Hosea, but what that righteousness actually is, Deuteronomy allows us to see that that righteousness is actually doctrine. Doctrine. When we are plowing and tilling the land, we are going to receive the outpouring of rain, which is an illustration through and through that the Bible makes use of. The illustration of the former and the latter rain. Through and through, this is a figurative illustration the Bible uses for the land and for the ability of the land to grow and to prosper. The, the land, because this is a book of crop people, they, everything that they're doing is for their crop deity. They believe that their deity provides them sustenance through their crops by their offerings and by their sacrifices and by their prayers. One of the signs that they know that they are beloved is the growth of their crops. Everything is in a crop language, it's in a farm language in the Bible, because on the surface, they're offering everything that they have, including their children at times, to a crop deity. So in 2024, we don't really connect with that, and such a deity is really non-existent to us at this time. In context, in context, the rain that is supposed to be sent from the temple above, is supposed to fall down onto what is within us. In the same application of a farmer, the same application of those crop individuals applies because you have to work the land in order for the rain to benefit whatever should benefit underneath it. We have to work the land of what is within us. And when we do, when we do, the season will appear. Well, what where what will rain down, says righteousness in Hosea, but the righteousness that will rain down, righteousness is just a code name for philosophy, for benevolent doctrine, for useful understanding. That's what that means. And so the idea of tilling for the purpose of, it won't be work when the routine gets there, but dressing, dressing the garden, it's to allow the devotional conversation not to fall into the trap of being deceived by a culture that it will not know. When entered into the religious world, the religious world has no sense. The religious world has no sense and has no care for how to care for your belief, even for its own. The religious world has no sense within it and no care. We will, when entered into the religious world, be deceived. And we will think that those that are not even attached to the religious world and yet still quote unquote expert and scholar and follower and enthusiast, so on and so forth, but however you want to put that, the deception will continue because there is no general tilling of the land, of the body of the belief personal or of the body of the belief concerning the theory for which that body, that personal body of belief is attached to. This great work, this great work of tilling the ground of what is within is going to yield always a rain of understanding, showers of understanding, showers of blessing, says the author in Ezekiel. This is the promise. And we can only get, get this promise and understand the value of this promise as we are willing to experiment with it and even tempt, tempt the process to or not to act. That's, that, that's the point. That's why it was given to the, to the pair in Genesis 1 and 2. It was a, a point of experiment that if done and if done well 
would have yielded understanding not to go into the route because the fundamental story is either you're going to go into the route of priesthood or you're not going to go into the route of priesthood and you're going to carry internally you're going to carry internally the ministry that should come out externally either you're going to choose one of those routes they chose the wrong one which was priesthood and we don't have to choose priesthood to be in priesthood mentally we can choose the dictates of that priesthood to govern what is within us at which point we commit the grossest error to our devotional culture so addressing the garden is important it's important so that we can escape the matrix beat and kill the deception to give rise to what can sustain us personally and to then what can be useful to others